paranormal-wise, mm -hmm. what do people report seeing in here? A dancing couple that dance in this theater on the dance floor. A typical episode of Ghost Hunters will start with a briefing shortly explaining the situation. The hunters are told what happened at the location and given a few hints on the paranormal activity there. This briefing sets the tone and creates anticipation for the viewer, sowing the seeds of horror in their mind. Thanks to this premise and the overall tone of the show, all it takes is a video of shadows moving, a faint sound or a vague feeling described by the crew to create that feeling of spookiness. Phasmophobia draws clear inspiration from this specific piece of media, as well as many other presents in popular culture, to exploit horror tropes. Welcome to the Game Dev Pantry, a channel where we provide a multitude of tools for game making. Phasmophobia is a multiplayer cooperative game about ghost hunting. The players must choose a job among a variety of haunted levels and, while those layouts are completely authored, they do have some random elements to be more replayable. Once the players are in the level, they are quickly briefed about their mission. They can also access their job's objectives, which will always contain a main objective, that is to identify the paranormal entity present at the location. The players gather paranormal evidence through the means of special equipment in order to find out exactly what is haunting the location. Sometimes, the entity will even manifest, making noises or taking physical form. When that happens, if the player's collective sanity is low enough, the entity will hunt the players and try to kill them. This makes for an incredibly unique horror experience. Most horror games have the players constantly avoiding the horror elements. Whereas in Phasmophobia, the players are actively looking for horror because they need to gather evidence. This makes for a very interesting push and pull dynamic between investigating horror and hiding from it. And while this is a very strong aspect of the game, I would argue that its greatest strength comes from clever use of intertextuality. Intertextuality is the idea that texts influence each other's meaning and perception. Text in that case refers to any media of course, whether it be books, movies, TV shows, but also video games. A simple example of this is that if you've never listened to a ghost hunting show before, you probably have no idea what an EMF reader is. However, if you did, there's a good chance you understand what it does, how to use it, and what it means when its light flashes. Every piece of media has an amount of intertextuality because nothing is created in a nutshell. Media content influences other content but also perception of each other. A recent example of that is when you reach an Orlando in Dark Souls 3. If you've never played the first Dark Souls, it's just an area like others. However, if you played the first one, you can start making parallels between how they portray the zone in the two different games, completely altering your perception of the game at that specific moment. Generally, video games use intertextuality to their advantage by relying on conventions to make learning processes simpler for new players. For example, the left joystick will often control the character's movement, while the bottom face button is used to jump in most platforming games. The health bar will most of the time be colored red or green, while mana or energy will be blue colored. These shortcuts allow players to transfer knowledge from one game to another, creating what we call game literacy. Essentially, the more games a player plays, the easier it will be for him to learn new ones. Intertextuality is a wonderful tool that often creates this feeling of that piece of media being part of something bigger. It can be used to add depth and meaning to it. However, it is most definitely a double-edged sword. If a piece of media relies too much on intertextuality, it can leave new viewers completely in the dark. While being left in the dark is quite literally the game's objective in Phasmophobia, 
it doesn't mean that players should have to be horror experts to enjoy it. The thing is, while Phasmophobia uses intertextuality, it doesn't rely on it, meaning that the player won't be lost if they have no previous knowledge of horror tropes. Instead, they use it as an opportunity to enhance the player's experience. Phasmophobia's entity system is particularly opaque, meaning that the players will only have glimpses of how it works. The game provides little to no hints as to exactly how entity behavior works, how the different elements in the map interact with the players, etc. While this specific decision would be terrible in almost any other game, it works beautifully in a horror game because it creates a blurry perception of the rules of play, but most importantly, it leaves a lot of space for interpretation. Since there are a lot of big gaps in knowledge, players will construct their own sets of belief, and that's where intertextuality comes into play. Phasmophobia is full of popular culture references and horror tropes. The maps are totally cliché, the tools are taken directly from the Ghost Hunters playbook, and the entity's abilities are portrayed like they are in most horror movies. This is simply amazing because it means players fill the blanks with their knowledge of horror tropes that exist outside of the game. An excellent example of that is the Ouija board. The Ouija board's rules exist in the collective imagination, outside of the game. Ask a question to the spirits, and it will answer spelling the word, one letter at a time. These rules are never explained to the players, so it's up to them to create their own set of beliefs regarding the board. Now, an interesting thing is that it's a multiplayer game, so these beliefs clash and refine themselves when they collide with other players. And sometimes, it leads to myth and fake rules existing within playgroups, or even the community as a whole. One very popular example of that phenomenon is the fact that most players believed that the ghost hunting would follow your voice to find you. This was in fact so widespread and added so much to the experience that the developers actually decided to make it an official rule. In Phasmophobia's case, creating rules that were intentionally nebulous and badly exposed to the players ended up creating this wonderfully unique dynamic of having the players fill in the gaps as a community, and I believe intertextuality had a massive impact on the player perception. Thank you again for joining us in this episode of the Game Dev Pantry. If you want to support us, please share our content, like or subscribe. We would like to thank our patrons for their amazing support, and if you'd like to help us more, you can join them by following the link in the description. See you all next time!